Hello and welcome to Raise Your Average. My guests today are our co-hosts on this show, Mike Philbrick and Rodrigo Gordillo. They are principals at Resolve Asset Management Global. They're also sub-advisors to the Horizons Resolve Adaptive Asset Allocation ETF, ticker HRAA. At the heart of our conversation, we're going to be talking about a chronic problem almost all of us investors are afflicted by, is the fact that the overwhelming majority of us are under-diversified profoundly under-diversified. And the worst part of this is that by the time we discover this truth, it's often too late, and there we are, caught with our pants down. This time is no exception. This past year and a half's conversations here on this show with some of the industry's most interesting and successful thought leaders has been so highly instructive on this topic. What's also come out of all these conversations is that our fellow hosts, Mike, Adam, and Rodrigo, not only love to talk about what they do a lot, and what they're cooking, they also, more importantly, eat their own cooking. So it's fitting that today we're going to be talking thoughtfully about how Resolve eats the free lunch of global diversification. So stay tuned, hit that subscribe button, let us know what you think. The views and opinions expressed in this broadcast are those of the individual guests and do not necessarily reflect the official policy or position of AdvisorAnalyst.com or of our guests. This broadcast is meant to be for informational purposes only. Nothing discussed in this broadcast is intended to be considered as advice. Mike, Rodrigo, what's up, guys? What's going on? All kinds of fun stuff's going on. <laughs> the, the world, the world yeah. is right again. Diversification matters. Risk management matters. <laughs> it's a uh, dispersion is amazing. It's awesome. Yeah, no, I mean, it's probably not awesome for most. And as you said in your introduction, Pierre, um, folks who have sort of fallen a little bit prey to uh, some overconfidence bias driven by, you know, recency bias of certain assets performing and whatnot have now kind of gotten a, a bias in their portfolio, which favors, you know, traditional stocks and bonds only. It's been a, it's been a decade of a, a, a proverbial wasteland in diversifying assets such as precious metals or commodities or hedge funds or, you know, funds that short things. And, um, so now we find many investors being caught flat footed. They don't quite have the exposure to those inflationary assets that will drive some returns during inflationary impulses. And, and how could they really, I mean, it's been a decade where those assets could be largely ignored, but now a bit flat footed, what should I do? Who should I allocate to? How should I work that in? When should I pull it back? When do I make a change? Will it come back? All of this sort of iterative thinking that sort of undermines good, thoughtful decision-making and portfolio construction. Uh, so those things are, uh, are, are a bit of our specialty. So at Resolve, you know, we, we design and deploy systematic strategies. So systematic means, you know, rules-based strategy grounded in some well-established investment, investment principles. Uh, we do our own proprietary quantitative research and there's, you know, a little bit of machine learning techniques deployed in there. And, and, um, we offer those strategies on behalf of, you know, uh, ETFs, mutual funds, uh, some separately managed accounts and hedge funds. And so, you know, business has been pretty good over the last six months. I can tell you, you know, it was, it was a tough sled to push for the last decade, you know, pushing risk management and diversity has not been the most popular thing. But here we do, here we are, the sun is shining and the, and the, you know, the wheat is ready to be harvested. I guess. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> a commodities play, I guess. So I think you're, you already sort of preambled a little bit, but you know, people know you guys as, as, as our co-hosts on raise your average, but, uh, I, I think it's time, you know, for us to get a real intro to resolve to you guys, to what you actually do for a living and what you focus on. And, and then we'll get to how investors have largely ignored some important line items in their portfolios. Yeah, I, I agree. I mean, I think, I, I, I think, as I mentioned, we are all about diversity, global strategies, risk balance strategies, and doing that through the eye of a, a mathematician, if you will, and, and taking the calculus to a level where, you know, it's kind of impossible for the human mind to contemplate the different types of asset classes, the balance and whatnot. So we, we basically, um, boil that down, you know, at the end of every day, a whole bunch of assets in the world trade, uh, markets close, we run our models. We understand the relationships between those assets, uh, the correlations, the volatility of those assets, 
and um, the differentiated nature of those assets and what their expected returns are. And we rebalance those portfolios on a regular basis, anywhere from looking at shorter term, uh, one to five days to some longer term items in, in, in different implementations of the various um, strategies across the different structures we might be offering these strategies through. So that's sort of the basis. Yeah. I, I, Rod, what, what would you add? Yeah, no, I just think from a very high level, what's important uh, to help it in, in advisors and investors differentiate us from other asset management firms is that we, we've not ever picked a stock in Resolve's existence. We don't do yeah. any stock picking, right? This is where 99% of computational brain power seems to go into, you know, Microsoft versus Apple, you know, investing in smart beta ATS are long only in the equity space and happen to be domestic. Our focus is exclusively being on the asset allocation decision, which we've all been taught to, to emphasize and, and understand that 90% of the directionality of your portfolio is in asset allocation rather than security selection. Um, and yet we don't apply that knowledge. So what we do is we pick asset classes globally, domestic, uh, equities, international equities, U S equities, sovereign bonds across the German boons, the UK guilds, Canadian treasuries, U S Canadian bonds, can, uh, government bonds, U S treasuries, and so on. We, we span the whole spectrum of commodities, right? The energies, the grains, the softs, the metals as well as currencies, right? Because this is where the action is. If you want to maximally diversify a portfolio and have the opportunity to not just survive a bad recession or an inflationary regime, but actually thrive in it, you need to contemplate that universe. And therefore that's the lens by which resolve asset management. Um, why, why do you, uh, why do you guys think it is that, I mean, you know, going back 20, 30 years, you know, I, I, those statistics have always been true. I mean, they've always been out there and that, you know, we've all been aware of it for this entire duration of, of the last two, three decades that diversification asset allocation, um, is responsible for 90% of the outcomes that we get in our portfolios. Why do you think it is that, that even though we know, and this stuff gets pounded into us, why do we ignore it? <laughs> I, I mean, I think it's human yeah. behavior. You get, you get. Um, you know, the, what, it, what's happened most recently, that recency bias tends to drive you to certain asset classes in 2008, after that major correction, you know, not a lot of people were, um, you know, running out to buy the U S 60, 40 portfolio. And, you know, if you look at that run from 2000 to 2007 and eight, when, you know, Canadian stocks and emerging market stocks did particularly well. Portfolios had a lot of commodities and they had a lot of commodity related products in them, just as we were about to enter into a decade long bear market in commodities, uh, and flip the script a little bit, right? NASDAQ peaks in 2000 yeah. and does nothing for 14 years. I mean, it has the correction in, in 08 along with everybody else. So it's got negative, you know, 60% total return for a, an eight year time frame. <laughs> Uh, nobody wants to own that at that moment in time. Uh, and so we find ourselves to some degree in that maybe peak balanced 60, 40 U S exposure. If we go back through time, that portfolio has a, has a sharp ratio. So the risk adjusted returns for the 60, 40 portfolio are about 50, call it 50 to 60 basis points. Well, the sharp ratio has been two over the last 10 years. That, that is a you know, almost a six Sigma event away from the mean. Yeah. And so when you spend time above average in order to get back to average, there will need to be some time spent below average. And so, you know, when does that time come is today that is today the, the, the moment. Well, if we think about the inputs, you know, the inflation and growth dynamics that drive asset prices. They have been very conducive for a portfolio made of stocks and bonds, especially in the domestic area in the U S uh, you have growth, low inflation, and you have abundant liquidity. That's what's happened in the last 10 years. We now are going to have a 10% CPI print. So inflation is not low. It's not benign anymore. <laughs> growth, growth is stuttering, if not slowing outright. Yeah. And further, we get the, the, the last thing is we have this contraction or movement away from abundant liquidity. We were quantitative easing, which is ending 
which when something that's easing ends, it is tightening along with interest rates that are rising. So those three legs of the stool that have been such great supporters of the 60-40 portfolio, global growth, benign inflation, abundant liquidity have now reversed. We now have contracting liquidity. We have uh, inflationary impulses and we have slowing growth. Asset classes that perform in that regime are very, very, very different than the ones that have enjoyed the sunshine for the last 10 years. Yeah. I think you want to look at this chart to understand why 6040 has dominated our psyche for so long, right? This is a chart that goes from 1900 to today. Identifying uh, so the, the equity line here is a 6040 US equity portfolio in real dollar terms, which is important here, right? So what, what matters is your actual real growth. And the beige areas are periods where you have that benign inflation, persistent growth, and abundant liquidity. And the last time, with the exception of the mid knots, right, 2000 to 2010, which we have forgotten yeah. about, we forgot that that was a rough period for 6040. If you think about when finance, when really started dominating uh, and being from a small portion of GDP to be one of the largest portions of GDP and many people getting into financial advice and financial um, uh, portfolio management, having retirement accounts, the RRSPs, RESPs and 401ks and Roth IRAs in the US, that period started in the 80s and has you know, grown in its importance. So from 1981, when Volcker broke the back of inflation to today, we have been dominated by a secular regime of disinflationary growth. And so the, when, when you're in that period, there's very li little that can beat a, a developed equity and bond portfolio, which is what a 6040 is, with the exception of that small period of 10 years. And in, as Mike alluded to, the last 10 years have been outstanding, possibly the 99th percentile best sharp ratio in its history. But note that in any other economic regime, whether it's inflationary growth, deflationary bust, inflationary, uh, sorry, deflationary bust or stagflation, like in right. the 70s, your 60-40 portfolio is going to underperform. By underperform, I mean no performance, right? Zero is what we see in history. So it, it's, it's tough to get this point across in the middle of a disinflationary growth regime. I think we're finally getting there. Well, yeah, it's, I'm, I'm, I'm often reminded of the Telab, the, the Nassim Telab story of the turkey, <laughs> right? I mean, a turkey doesn't know Thanksgiving Day is coming. Right. And, you know, as, as the turkey gets closer to Thanksgiving Day, the farmer feeds him more and treats him even better and keeps the foxes away. How's the turkey to know that Thanksgiving is upon us? <laughs> I think, I think it's ironic that, you know, like it, 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 it takes us so long to let go of our emotionality. It takes us, you know, like the, you have the dot com crash and then, you know, it took literally what, 12 years for us to resume yeah. interest in technology stocks. And now we've had, we've had, you know, we've had a decade of, of, uh, this disinflationary boom or, uh, that, that we're talking about and how long is it going to take for us to let go or unwind the emotionality of how well the last 10 years went before we, we actually start to make meaningful or thoughtful decisions for the portfolio that, that put us in a good position for the next 10 or 12 years. Nothing motivates like a yeah. crisis, right? I mean, it's always, it's always going to be crisis necessity change. And, uh, you'd be surprised Pierre, how much change is happening that we see. We, we are definitely seeing a, a strong adoption of what we're going to discuss today of protecting against bond bear markets, protecting against equity bear markets. It, it's happening and it's happening quickly. Of course, the best time to, to plant a tree is 50 years ago. The next best time is today, right? So better something than nothing. At least people are, are acting. I mean, I think, you know, how we met and how we came to know you was through the amount of education that you guys have been producing over the last decade through this, this period that was really, as you said, Mike, a tough sled to push. 
And let's get into your research. What motivated you guys to, what, what made you realize like yeah. that you have to you put all the cards on the table and show everything, you know, and say, you know, you know, and, and, and make this effort, this gargantuan effort that you guys have been making for a decade to, uh, to get advisors on board. It's a good question. I think it starts with our personalities. I think, uh, Mike and myself and Adam are really, we love to seek truth in, in uncomfortable discussions. And, uh, we've always had that w with each other. Uh, people love to be fly on the walls when, when we're at, going at it. And while it may seem uncomfortable, it often leads us all to move to a place of commonality. You know, it's, a, it's an ongoing process, but it, it, those discussions lead to insights that it just, it, it would be folly not to go out and tell the world what we're thinking and what we're discovering as, as we have these discussions. And our personalities are ones of liking to, to, to coach, to educate. It's always been part of our DNA at Resolve. And we're lucky that, um, that we have enough people on the team that can clearly articulate that in writing. Adam's a fantastic yep. writer. Um, we all help in the narrative, but he can distill it very clearly. And so, and then, you know, from, from being able to put on a podcast and, and be able to articulate things well, Mike, Adam, Mike and Adam and ourself are, are pretty, um, willing to do that and, and then take the backlash on social media when we are. Yeah, and you guys, and you, and, and, um, and you, it, but it, so that's part of it. It's our sorry, personality. And a big part or, of that is that the, you know, the three of you, plus the, uh, the whole resolve team, you don't agree with each other on everything. Or, or yeah. no, it, we <laughs> rarely <certainly> don't. <laughs> rarely agree yeah. with each other. And we it's certainly, that. <laughs> it's an honest yeah. public. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so that's one aspect. The other aspect is what, where we went into is so esoteric for the average investor and advisor that there was no way that we were going to find success if we didn't do our part in breaking it down piece by piece, time and time again, telling the same story in different ways until we got enough, we got to enough, enough people that, that we're getting, you know, they're taking the red pill yeah. and not coming back. Right. Once you go down the rabbit hole, it's not the resolve rabbit hole. It is the truth rabbit hole. It is the, the understanding and recognition of the true dynamics of markets and what you can do. Um, it, there's no turning back. So we, what's been beneficial about the content that we put out is that once we get people to go down that rabbit hole, we seem to keep them for a long time as, as dedicated and loyal, uh, you know, followers and, and investors, unlike you know, just trying to say, you know, dividend stocks, you know, we run a dividend company. You understand that fully, right? We we're, we're slightly better than the competition and they get a bunch of assets. And when you underperform, you get redeemed, right? We have, uh, we have a following that has led to people adding to our products when we have a, uh, a, you know, well, I think, I think a big, so sorry, I, I, that's, that's, I think the, that's a big the key. part of that Rodrigo is that what's what's really uh refreshing about the way that you guys have gone about it is that um you're honest about the fact that you don't know you just simply don't know what's going to happen uh you know and 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 i think what you've taught what you've done what you've gone to great lengths to to teach and sort of what i've sort of gleaned from it from from all of our conversations is that um is to let go of those directional biases to let go of, of what, you know, what we all think at any given moment is a high conviction bet that we're willing to, to vote with our money. Um, and, 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 you, you know, yeah. I love that, that Voltaire quote, you know, um, about uncertainty. <laughs> it's one of my favorites and, yeah. you know, you guys happen to use it, but it's, 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 uh, there's, there's nothing, there's nothing worse than nothing more risky than, than having this high conviction that your, your, your bet is the right one at any given time. And that's why diversification is, is so important. The kind of diversification that you're talking about that we're going to talk about. Um, and you got, what, what's, what's really cool is that you guys have distilled it into your strategy. Yeah. And I think my favorite quote is from Mark Twain, just to throw it in there and then I'll let, I'll pass it on to Mike. It's the idea, or his quote is, uh, it ain't what you don't know that gets you into trouble is what you know for yeah. sure. And is that your favorite? So. Is that your favorite? That's the quote, world we live in. Or is that Mike's? It's my favorite. <laughs> that is my favorite. It's yeah. one of mine too, for sure. Yeah. For sure. But I think, I think the idea of sharing too is, is, uh, something that I'm very comfortable with. And I think 
I've had to, to some degree, help our team understand that, you know, it, it's, it's Docaine from the turtle traders. And he said, it doesn't matter. And I don't know if you remember Docaine, turtle traders. And then you had, you know, sort of the, 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 the great movie with Eddie Murphy trading places with yeah. Mortimer and Randall Duke, and they were emulating, you know, William Eckhart and Richard Dennis back in the day. But, you know, the trading great said, you can publish your rules, your winning rules. Just put them on the front page of the paper. No one will be able to follow right. them because they don't, they haven't internalized what it means to follow them. They've seen some sort of profit outline or some sort of percentage thing that they sp suspect to get, but they haven't traveled the path. And we have encountered this many, many, many times where institutions or other investors or uh, have tried to emulate what we do in adaptive asset allocation. There's been whole parts of certain pension funds we've heard of where they've said, oh, we're going to take this concept yeah. and run it. And it always seems to go awry. Um, they want to put their own twist on it. They want to throw a bias on it. They don't quite fully understand the philosophical journey that they're on. And so sharing very openly about that journey and how hard that path is to walk and then staying true to that path is a big part of getting people to adopt this. And it is, it's, it's very much in my mind, still a blue ocean strategy. It's still a strategy where we're doing something different. Um, the reason the Porsche is still an amazing sports car is because the engines over the back wheels. And that is what makes it, yeah. you can doll it up, you can paint it, the stereo and it sucks. And you can, you can try and line it up against a Maserati or an Austin Martin or whatever other supercar that you would like this little VW bug with the engine over the back wheels to eat its lunch. So the engine over the back wheels from a Porsche's perspective is very much, Hey, asset allocation matters more than security selection. Yeah. That's a concept that still has not been sort of well adopted. And so you have to share, you have to, you know, sort of take it uh, to the, to the highest mountaintop and yell, and then people will in the short run say, see, you're wrong. <laughs> Look what happened over the last three months or one month ago, since you said that. And you know, what's misunderstood is that these things happen over, over time frames of three, five, and 10 years. Look at the cycles we've talked about in the past, whether it was the tech cycle, the resource boom, the second resource boom, the oil embargo of the seventies. Again, these things are longer moving cycles, which does give time for people to prepare. We're seeing early adopters now start to say, wait a second, there has been a regime shift. How do I deal with this? Hey, let's call the guys at Resolve because they've actually thought this through. And because we've been talking about this for 10 years, at least they know who to call. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know, it's kind of like Ghostbusters. We got a ghost. You call Resolve. <laughs> <laughs> more, if you want more eighties movies references, I'm here. all You day. know what? I, I remember, <clears throat> I remember from our uh, conversation with, uh, with Hugh Hendry not too long ago. Um, he talked about one of the things he talked about that was really, uh, an interesting point was that, you know, when he thought a decade ago or 12 years ago that China was going to bust, um, you know, he, he honestly just comes out and says, you know, he was way too premature. What he realized was that, you know, he sort of put this idea together that, that, you know, the Chinese Zodiac is based on 12 years and, mm -hmm. and, and what he misunderstood was that, you know, what he thought was imminently going to happen would actually take a 12 year cycle to unfold because of the, yeah. And what I loved about Hugh's thought process was if we're going to get to some deflationary, you know, uh, Dave Rosenberg type of scenario, well, it's, it's a sine wave. You've got to snap the rubber band way over here. And then some stuff has to happen to cause yeah. governments to rip it back down here. It's not something that can just manifest on its own. You've actually got to bend or you got to stretch that band in one way in order to get it ripped back the other way. So as he's gone through that, Hey, here's how we get back to zero rate. So let me, <laughs> let me roll yeah. that out for you. 
it's pretty epic because you've got to do what we're doing. Get this really massive inflationary impulse. Have central banks of the world have to orchestrate a slowdown in growth to allow supply chains to heal and allow the resource components to catch up to the potential growth, which then means you have this, this growth um, uh, cavern, which means the you know, economy collapses again, and then you have to go back to zero rates again in order to, re, to restart the whole system. And so he's got this very interesting way of thinking about how things proceed to an eventuality and what's required in one direction in order to make the thing that you think is going to happen in the other direction. Yeah. Is it, you know, what's, what's amazing about that and what's unfortunate about the way we see portfolios today, which tends to be dominated uh, by 60, 40, or maybe it used to be now it's more like 80, 20 and the 20% is more like private equity and private credit, which right. is just more equity, but without market to market, the volatility, um, is that what you just described, Mike, is a period of, of like back and forth between inflation and recession. What are the two blind spots for the 60 40 yeah. portfolio? What are the two things that they're most Preach. susceptible yeah. to? Right? Like, I mean, you got your bonds, we're seeing it. You got bonds getting crushed at the same time as equities. Why? Because we're seeing a dual inflation and recession, i.e. stagflation. But this is going to go back and forth. There's going to be a period of, there's going get, to get to a point where it's going to be a pain point. They're going to, the, the Fed and, and, and the governments are going to do fiscal and monetary spends. That's going to lead to a reflation. It's going to lead to growth. But bonds are going to continue to suffer because inflation is going to happen. So this yo-yo, this, inf this, this period of inflation volatility, yeah. we have not seen since 1981, since prior to 1981. And AHL, was yeah. it AHL, Mike? I think AHL put a report up that showed that. Like, what, what were the differences in, yeah, I, in I inflation prior, volatility? Right, inflation volatility time. from 1925 to 1990 was about 4.8%. Since 1990, it's been 1.3%. So like a 65. Right. And what people production. don't, yeah. And what people don't understand is that recession and inflation come yeah. hand in hand. This is just, it has to, right? Because remember what the dual mandate is of the Fed governor is to, to balance inflation versus growth. And, and what Volcker had to do in 1981, he had to break the back of inflation. And the consequence of that was a massive recession, right? But it's, it's what is the medicine that it requires. So what does 6040 need? It needs, we need to fill in those blind spots. Right? This is part, this has been the major focus of our research for more than 10 years and, uh, and how we've structured our products. And but see, isn't it, isn't it funny how, like, I, I just think it's reminiscent with your journey, like the length of the length of time that you guys mm -hmm. have actually been on this journey to, to talk about all these different components, uh, sort of parallels what we're talking about as well. I mean, you know, even on a very, uh, you know, on a simple point is like, for the last decade, fundamentals have fallen on deaf ears. You know, for the last decade, diversification has fallen on deaf ears, has led to these, you know, these unbelievable biases that culminated in, in you know, the, the end of 2021. Uh, and then the turn at the, uh, the turn at the beginning of this year, I mean, this year so far has been just a, a you know, a route. And, um, Mm -hmm. So it, 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 it's, it's amazing to see just, you know, the, the, the way things unfold, uh, how that's unfolded into, uh, well, so much exactly what you've been talking about for so long. Yeah. And it's yeah. gratifying to see that I the bet. portfolios respond in the way, um, we have suggested they would. And many of the, the investors and clients along the way have been very heartened by that. And even the prospective clients have said, oh, actually it worked like you said it was going to work. <laughs> that never happens. I'm like, well, <laughs> thanks for waiting and keeping us on the, uh, on the docket. But well, I think also just one more thing that the, the other thing is there's this inflation that's occurring. And I want to make sure we emphasize mm -hmm. Rodrigo's point because there's, there's this, you know, mean rate of inflation, right? It is, you know, whatever the average rate's going to be, these dynamics of inflation and growth shocks create the volatility around inflation. That's what we saw pre-1990. It was volatile. The idea of inflation and growth, they were volatile. They have not been volatile since 1990. What happens? Well, you get assets priced for per perfection. You get very high multiples because you've had benign inflation, because you've had consistent growth. 
And because you had abundant liquidity, you get these very lovely valuations. Those have shifted. Even if inflation were to continue to moderate, run lower, there are going to be shocks that cause the volatility, the variance around the mean to be higher, which means that asset prices have to have higher future expected returns, i.e. be lower than they are now, in order for an investor to justify investing. And this is happening across the board. So paying attention to how much risk you're taking, where's the balance of your risk in asset classes that respond to these <clears throat> various regimes is incredibly important and is at the core of what we do and have been doing for yeah. 10 years. So those are the blind spots. Those are the blind spots, right? Yeah, I mean, correct. So how can investors, you know, how can we think about filling in those blind spots? Yeah. I mean, that's a good question. And a lot of advisors we're talking to both in Europe, US and Canada immediately go to what's easy for them, right? So what's, what's been comfortable and what do they know? They know stocks. Mm -hmm. Right. And so the immediately what they try to do is they, within that stock realm, they try to pivot towards, uh, inflation sensitive stocks. And that is a good, like, by the way, it's a good first step in, in, in rotating to the energy sector maybe. Right. But the reality is it's stocks on their own are half what the underlying product is in this case would be energies or commodities of some sort, but half is their cash flows. Right. And so in a bear market, in a, in a period where all of the economy is going down, there's less demand for everything, you are going to have, you're not going to have that diversification that you need on the inflation side by tilting towards the commodity-based energies, and you're going to get hurt on the bear side. So it's not a perfect product. So what's the next best thing? Canada, especially, right. seems to be gold. Okay. So gold as an inflation hedge, and sometimes as a disaster hedge, right? The problem with gold, of course, is that Inflation isn't just monetary inflation, right? It's supply shock uh, inflation. It is demand pull inflation. It is a wide variety of things. And, and people have gotten very disappointed with gold's performance in the last, in, in 2021, because the monetary inflation happened in 2020, right? That's when we went from positive rates to negative rates, where the gold is highly correlated to that monetary impact. And then flatlined when energies, when all the energy markets, the grain markets, you know, all the traditional supply chain disrupted elements were making a killing. So you, uh, you can't just do it with gold. So then you get into the passive commodity sleeve. You can buy the Deutsche Bank commodity index as an ETF, for example, right? And absolutely that has been tremendous, um, as a way to hedge inflation. But again, inflation and recession go hand in hand. So what has happened to a passive commodity index as a hedge during periods of recession, when the, when the Fed finally starts fighting that inflation, you have massive, it, it drops higher, uh, lower and more aggressively than your 60, 40, it, it drops lower and more aggressively than your equity. So you've managed to momentarily fill the inflation gap of your 60, 40, but you've supersized your bear market risk, right? And so. Again, we have an imperfect hedge for the two blind spots that uh, the 6040 have, right? A good hedge would be an outsized allocation to sovereign bonds when that recession happens, assuming there's no inflation. But of course, we have gone down to nearly zero allocation of sovereign bonds. Not, so, not we, you know, general you might, investors, not we. Not, <laughs> we haven't, we general, in the sense of right, other yeah. people and investors. <laughs> Yeah, at large. <laughs> so that's kind of the paradigm. That's what we're. That's what yeah. I'm seeing, and that's what I'm seeing everybody stop at. Right? They're they're thinking those are the things that we can do, and then the, it becomes their job to become traders as advisors. Now you have to trade when the inflation trade is over to get to get out of your commodities, and you have to trade when it's appropriate to go long yeah. sovereign bonds again. E equally dangerous. It's a tough gig. Advisors are, are focused on building their business. You want to you want to create a strategic asset allocation that has those three engines your equities for growth, your sovereign bonds for bear markets, and something that can fill in that commodity inflation and maybe help out the bonds when, um, when the recession comes. And to us, the natural next step, and AHL Diversified also wrote a fantastic report on this that kind of goes through what works, in long, short, multi-asset, you know, the managed futures of the world, the trends, the, the carries, the value investing, this picking stock uh, asset classes long and short across commodities, equities, bonds, and, 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 uh, and currencies have been always, from the beginning of our research, the ones that make the most sense. 
to fill in yeah. both the recession. But I seriously doubt that absence. that advisors want to actually become Randolph and Mortimer. You know, it, it, it's it's mm. it's such a reach, and it's so outside of what the requirements of of the profession are in terms of managing you know your book and managing your clients. That that you know why wouldn't you you know hand that off or delegate that responsibility to people who do it all day long and that's all they do and they're not they're not you know they're not they're not having to you know manage one on one their clients expectations they're 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 you know their their bread and butter is literally just doing what you're talking about all day long and 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 without having to have the the client management interaction you know you know interrupting that I think, I think one of the challenges there, um, is that the advisor, uh, or allocator often will assume that that role of asset allocation is theirs. <clears throat> and then they're going to delegate the security selection. Um, the challenge then becomes, of course, what we see happen in portfolios is the line item yeah. risk, which is why do I have this line item of commodities that went down 55%, then rallied a bit, then went down 15 you know, back down to 55? Why, why do we have that over the last 10 years? And this is why many of those asset classes have been punted out of portfolios, both on retail and in institutional portfolios over the last decade and a half, because they've been a drag. Yeah. And diversification by definition is a drag. You will have something in your portfolio that's killing it and something that's killing you. And we perceive, you know, our sort of no harm place to start is the all weather or risk parity portfolio where you're balanced across the different regimes and you are including all of these asset classes and you're saying, Hey, I'm prepared and I'm just going to de-emphasize prediction. We obviously that's, that to us is beta. That's the do no harm base of the market portfolio. Then as Rodrigo alluded to, there's long, short multi-asset strategies that are very uh, accretive to that portfolio, but let's start with the no harm portfolio. Let's measure whether we actually add value, uh, with active bets in the portfolio or active allocations in the portfolio, which we do, um, on, from our perspective. Um, and then let's add those tilts to the portfolio. Uh, but you know, first be diversified yeah. and be diversified. So People think a 60, 40 is diversified. It's neither diversified, nor is it balanced. You know, the balanced portfolio is silly. It's 90% stock exposure from a risk perspective, right? So that's imbalanced. And, um, you know, that's not diversity. You know, you've got one, one basic bet and it's overbalanced to that thing. And that regime's your regime has happened to work. So now if you're in a risk parity portfolio, you've basically sailed through the last year quite nicely. You know, even the year to date, I think most, most sort of well-conceived risk parity portfolios are down two to 3%. Some are down a little bit more, some are up yeah. a little bit more construction, but sort of average, maybe down two or 3%, kind of a yawn, not down 20%, not down 15%. It's kind of a, oh my God, it's happening in my portfolio. Oh, nothing. I'll go back to work. I'll go back to do the stuff because you were prepared yeah. because you know, the steps you're going to take, you know, how you're going to rebalance. And those things are being done daily. And so that's where we would start. And in the Horizons Resolve Adaptive Asset Allocation ETF, in that particular product, the base is that risk parity base that we're talking about. First start yeah. there. Funny how, funny how, you know, 10 years of S&P returns, S&P 500 returns at 16%, you know, twice the historical average is the reason why nobody's diversified up till the end of 2021 and 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 though you know what you just said which was that that the uh you know if you look at at the the risk parity you know average being you know what minus minus a few percent um yeah. a yawn but you know who wants the excitement of negative 20 you know minus 20 percent Right. Which, which then, which then forces you to rush for the exit. Like, you know, like a crazy, oh, I need diversification. Well, as long as my yeah. friends, as long as my friends are down 20%, I feel a little bit better about that. Yeah, absolutely. That's, you know, that's, that's a problem with investing, yeah. right? That's your, 
that's tracking error. And so that's definitely something that needs to be attenuated. And we've written on, uh, attenuating tracking error through return stacking, which is, you know, okay, you've got the 60, 40 as your tracking error sensitivity. So we mean, we need to make sure you get that. And now let's stack on all of these alternative sources of return to make sure that you can stay the course. You've got your 60, 40, so you know, you're suffering or celebrating with your friends, but Hey, look at how we can enhance that even, um, and give you all of that. Plus this diversifier on our products, what we've sought to do is say, okay, well, we're not, you know, I don't want to sign up for the 60, 40 right now. Cause I don't, I don't, that's not my tracking error. And I don't think it's going to be a good thing to track for the next 10 years. So in our products, it's the risk parity, the most balanced, the highest sharp ratio portfolio of multi-asset, generally speaking. Um, and then add the alpha on top. Yeah, of can that. you imagine, Maybe I mean, can, can you, can you imagine me. yeah. what happens if you're, you know, if a, a bunch of people are at a party and, and everybody's down 20% and then, and then, and then the one, the one person who's at the party, who's only down two or 3% speaks up, what, what, what would happen there? You know, like the immediate. There's, there's two, there's <laughs> I two, was there. there's two I sets of people. It. So <laughs> go ahead. Yeah. Well, I, in no way. You know, for, uh, for my book, you know, in, in my allocation decision that included this type of multi-asset long short, I mean, we're up 20% in that section of the portfolio and overall, um, you know, we're looking at 7% positive returns yeah. in 2008. Right. And so I'll tell you what I felt when I, when it first started happening, when that September, October came, I felt vindicated. I felt like high-fiving somebody. And when I put my hand yeah, up there, there was, no there was nobody there. around. Advisors were <laughs> literally not around literally depressed, right? I think we all, anybody who lived it, I'm, I'm, I'm not even saying this as a joke. Like it was a tough, it was a tough go for any investor where associates were taking the calls for advisors, where friends of mine yeah. weren't getting callbacks from advisors because they, they didn't have anything positive to say there. It was, it was a really tough period, obviously not all advisors, but it, a large proportion didn't show up and I don't blame them. It is a depressing thing when you think your career all the assets that you built were gone in, in a three month period, right? If you were a Canadian small cap manager focused advisor that killed it the previous 10 years and then got wiped out 70%, how would you feel? So for me, living through that was moment, a moment of vindication and then actually wanting yeah. it to stop. I remember I kept, you know, the portfolio kept growing, but I really wanted it to stop because it was hurting so many people around us. Right. So it, it, it's, I don't. You know, it's not a point of pride that we're outperforming everybody. I don't want to be proud. I don't want to feel like I'm better. I just want everybody on board. And, and there's no reason not to diversify that risk oh. away. I don't want advisors to be paid to hold people's hands yeah. when they're losing 50%. I want advisors to be paid to make positive returns when the markets are, the equity markets specifically are down 50%. That's what I want. That's the dream. That's why we educate. And that's why we put like eight, uh, HRAA, yep. HRA, the Horizon Resolve Adaptive Asset Allocation Fund, provides that base balance of risk parities. And then on top of that, that pure alpha that's lowly correlated to risk parity that's going long and short things and has allowed us to be, for example, short bonds this year. Yeah. Right? Y y the advisor needs to have a strategic allocation of bonds. We'll short for you. Right? We, we can go long energies and grains. We can short the S&P and the NASDAQ while going long emerging markets. Like there's a wide variety of things that we can do that you can't to provide that protection. I think we can, we're coming to a point where we can actually add that value, add that peace of mind. And so, yeah, what are people thinking in that party? They hate you. And then you hate, you know, you for being that guy, well, they, uh, to answer your question. No some, some of them, some who of them, the hell ask, is that like, Rodrigo who's, think your, he is? who's your, who's your, who's your advisor? I, I need to yeah, talk to him. Exactly. You have to, don't, don't invite those people back to the party ever again. <laughs> <laughs> just never invited back. And the funny thing is like, I mean. I don't think we're particularly smart guys. I don't think we're particularly dumb guys. You know, we're sort of disciplined guys. Uh, and, and, you know, all of a sudden the last eight months is, wow, you know, the, geez, how did you know? Like, I, we didn't, we're, we're doing the same stuff we were doing before. It's a bit of groundhog day. Here are the core tenants to successful investing. Here's how you do it. Here's how you layer them together. And here's how you attenuate some of the behavioral biases that you might have. That message for us has yeah. been pretty much the same for a decade. Now we're just popular at the party. Because here's the thing, Pierre, 
we 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 said a lot of things about we've disappointed people in the last 10 years, you know, people that stuck with us. But we really did. Our longest running track record is 10 years. It has a sharp ratio of 0.85. Okay? That's twice that of a, of the long-term sharp ratio of a 60/40. I mean, for if you if you run that at 10% volatility, you'll get 8% rate of return. Isn't that what everybody wants? Right? Is it, shouldn't everybody be happy Apparently about not. that? not. I mean, of course, they're unhappy <laughs> about that. Yeah. They're unhappy about that because you mentioned the 16% annualized return of the S&P. And so it's not that we failed. It's not that we disappointed. We, did ex we put together exactly what we, what we wanted and the outcome was exactly what we expected. And year to date, as of April 29th of 2022, we're up around 10, 11%. No different than what we'd be up on average most years, right? There is no difference. This idea of all weather, this idea of being persistent and consistent, that's, that's something achievable. And uh, right now it seems crazy good because markets are down 15%. And we're up 10 at 25% differential by markets. I mean, equity markets. But within that portfolio, you know, we have things that are losing money as well. So that's the point. The point is not that we did something, we're doing something outrageously great right now is that we've done something that is super accessible, middle of the line all years. And this is what happens when we can differentiate based on what people care about. Which yeah, is I, I think, I think, and I'm sorry, Mike, I, I, I just wanted to say that, that, you know, everything boils down to like, it doesn't matter, you know, good versus bad doesn't seem, doesn't matter anymore. Everything is just better or worse. I'm doing, I'm doing better than, or I'm doing worse than, and everything is relative, right? I mean, a lot of the industry has shaped a lot of commentary around relative performance and what's doing better and what's not doing as well. But it, you know, it's like when somebody, you know, when you say to somebody, oh, how are you doing? And they say, uh, better, you know, that doesn't mean good. That just means, you know, it doesn't mean good, right? It just means, yeah. it just means better and better could still be minus 10 versus minus 20 yeah. and, and either way, that's not good. Mm -hmm. So like, there's very, there's very little absolute talk in, in, in markets and in investing. Well, there will be once we get the yeah. bear market. Yeah. But if you start to hear about absolute returns once we're, once we have, you know, 20, but as an, ad, as an well, advisor, like, do you really want to wait for that? Exactly. No, I, I don't think so. And, and there's been, you know, the other thing that's, that's occurred in Canada that has been uh, quite advantageous for Canadian investors. Canada continues to be on the leading edge of a number of different product developments. And one of the things that allowed us to create HRAA or Horizons uh, Resolve Adaptive Asset Allocation portfolio, uh, we were running a pure risk parity portfolio, but you couldn't get leverage into an right. ETF uh, that was prior to the liquid alt regulations changes. Now, once we had the liquid alternatives regulations update and they allowed for some use of leverage across a diversified portfolio, all of a sudden, you know, some, some real doors opened for, uh, providers and asset managers like us to partner with horizons and really offer a, an absolutely kick-ass product, uh, to investors. And there's a couple of very unique features to this that are exceptional that are not, literally not available anywhere else in the world that, that we should talk about. So not only is it a strategy, um, opportunity, it's a structure opportunity yeah. and structure often limits strategy. Um, in the case in Canada with liquid alts, you know, this is a, this is a medium risk product and as a medium risk product has just tremendously attractive tax considerations and tremendously attractive sort of portfolio construction opportunities within it. I don't know if Rod, you want to elaborate on a few of those? Yeah. So, so yeah, let, let me, let me parse that out. So what Mike means by moderate risk is that we run it at volatility target of 8%. Right. This is very similar to that of a blue chip, uh, bond portfolio, but without the tail risk, a uh, blue chip bond portfolio, we've seen drawdowns of 35, 40% in 08. Um, because of the diversification benefits of what we just described, you're, we shouldn't expect, um, we should probably expect half of that drawdown in, in the future history of the, or the future of this product. So that's from a structural perspective, from a volatility perspective, uh, and labeling within the vast majority of broker dealers, 
we run at medium risk, which means that advisors can allocate a, a significant amount to make an actual yeah, difference so, to their portfolio. So that, that that's saying, key. saying that, that you're the running thing, at 8% yeah. volatility, that's basically a cap on, on, on the amount of volatility mm -hmm. that the strategy. Well, it's, it's an average. Yeah. It's plus an, or minus, plus or minus 2%, depending on, on average, average, but yeah, over that's the average. My market cycles, 8%. But it sets a, it sets a ceiling. Like a, like a put, like it sets a, it yeah. sets a ceiling on, 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 uh, how much volatility can be expected or experienced. Yeah. It's an important aspect of risk management yeah. on drawdown. For sure. For sure. Right. Drawdown meaning uh, maximum peak to trough loss. And then the other structural advantage, I mean, the, the, one of the reasons why this all weather concept and, and investing in futures in Canada has not been, uh, widely adopted or widely offered. We really are like one of a very small handful of public products available in this space is that futures are taxed really inefficiently, right? And every year, regardless of whether you bought or sold, you are marked to market on what you made and you pay a full income, whatever your income is on that P&L and you get a, right. a tax slip that you have to pay. So that tax inefficient, there's no capital gains. There's no, there's just pure income. So why would that be attractive? Well, within the Horizons corporate class structure, we have an ability to redistribute that. And so there's no expected distributions at the end of the year. And, and as far as I can tell, and this may have changed, we're the only ones in Canada that have this ability, right? So within this handful of structures that can do long, short, multi-asset across commodities, equities, bonds, um, uh, rates and um, currencies. We're the only ones that can keep that in people's pockets until they sell. And when they sell, it's but that, that's, right? that's seriously, yeah, Super I agree crucial. with you. That's seriously important. That's, that's something that, that, you know, anyone who would try to do these things on their own, uh, would not have the tax efficiency that you've accomplished there. That's, yeah. And then the last thing I'll say, because we, we threw up the liquid alt, uh, label. Um, I, I think it's kind of like saying equity manager, right? There's many styles within that space. And in Canada, we're dominated. The liquid alt space is dominated by traditional long short Canadian right. equity managers. It's it just more the same. It's just like, uh, you know, the S&P TSX 60 with a slightly lower volatility. Um, that's not going to give you inflation protection and it's not going to give you bear market protection most likely. Okay. Um, Within the, the many alternative sleeves that exist in the world, and if you go to the HFRI index categories, you can kind of look to see them. We have a chart that, that I can, you know, link to that shows a correlation of all of these stat ARB, you know, merger ARB, long, short equity, market neutral, and so on. Every single one of them has a, a, a positive correlation to the S&P and a positive correlation to bonds. The only category uh, in the hedge fund space that has very close to zero in both equities and bonds is the SOC Gen CTA index, for example, or the Goldman Sachs, uh, global macro systematic index, which is kind of the two categories we right. fall into. Right. So this is a unique liquid alternative within the liquid alternative space that this category, in my opinion, is the most crucial to really focus your attention on and get educated on because it's, it's the most likely to fill in those key gaps. And so th that's another structural reason why we're so excited about this product. I, I can't wait to see what this looks like in 10, 12 years. Yeah. What are the actual moving parts of HRAA? So the moving parts are, we've yeah. addressed it quite a few, right? And, um, and there's a ton of education on it. If you guys want to go to our site, um, and, and we'll put some links to it, but really it's, it's trying to, everybody's probably at this yeah. point heard of Ray Dalio, right? And heard of Bridgewater. I mean, a huge inspiration, right? You, you want to have a sense of humility and you, you want to have the belief that you can do better by uh, your profession. And our profession is one, of course, of trying to predict the future and trying to pick the right asset classes at the right time and the right weights. Um, let me talk about the, the hum hu humility part. That's risk parity. The idea of risk parity, it's an explicit recognition of our ignorance. It's, it's the, the belief that it's okay to have things killing, killing it and have things in your portfolio that are killing you in order to have yeah. that balance. Right. So that is the first layer of HRA for every dollar that you give us, you're going to get a dollar risk exposure of risk parity. That is our attempt to be humble.
and to, and to participate in global in ingenuity and global growth. It is a long only strategy and it's a long only strategy with it's tactical because we're, we're putting our risk parity goggles on and instead of giving, you know, commodities, equities, and bonds an equal dollar weight, what we're doing is we're putting equal, we want equal risk contribution. So that means that when I put my goggles on, I can see how risks are changing by how much they're correlating to each other and what their relative volatilities are. And so, for example, the last couple of months, equities and bonds have become highly correlated. And so a risk parity portfolio will de-emphasize both of those assets and emphasize commodities, not in an attempt to predict the future movement of them, but in an attempt to re maintain that perfect balance. All right. So you have that key component of humility. And then we have, we believe we have expertise in trying to predict the next five days movement of right. all these asset classes, right? So we're not trying to predict what's going to happen to commodities over the last 12 months. We're legitimately trying to just try to find on average, what's going to happen in the next five days. And the, the second layer. So for the other dollar that you're going to get in risk exposure is going to be in this systematic global macro, which is just a fancy word for saying I can go long and short all of these asset classes over 50 different futures contracts. And at any given day, I have an equal chance of going long and short each one of these. And so the correlation of this, of this stacked, um, uh, asset class or strategy is zero to the risk parity. And so what you're sacking is whatever return you get from risk parity, you're going to get, and whatever return you're going to get from uh, the systematic macro, you're going to get, you're stacking those returns, but because of the zero correlation, you're not necessarily stacking the risk. Right. 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 It's digging and zagging. It's, it's buying a ski company yeah. that has cash flows in the winter. And then also buying a bike company that has cash flows in summer. They both make money, but they do it in offsetting ways so that at the end of the day, you get the same return, if not more because of the rebalancing of cash flows, but with a lower volatility. So that is the, that is the, the rate value approach is their all weather strategy that they offer institutions and their pure alpha that they're offering institutions. And then they let them mix and match what they want. We've been presumptuous enough to say 50, 50 is probably good for advisors and investors. And then the final piece that we, that we added that we're very proud of is the you know, the blind, everything has a blind spot and the blind spot for his parity, um, that's v rarely talked about is liquidity shocks. So Mike talked about right. abundant liquidity that benefits risk parity as well. Cause when there's abundant cash, everything floats, right? Everything, all boats, uh, float in a rising tide, but there are moments, acute moments, like in October of 08 and March, 2020, where liquidity dries up everywhere. Right? So in that crash of the COVID crash, you saw risk parity flatline while the market crashed in the first couple of weeks and then had a big drop. That was because they were flatlining because treasuries and gold was going up. And in the last few days, both equities, treasuries and gold went down together. So that liquidity shock, the only thing that goes up in a liquidity event is volatility. And so we have an overlay that's almost always off 95% of the time it's off. But when we identify, uh, through quantitative methods, when the term structure of the volatility, uh, markets change we have the opportunity to go long the VIX right. and long the V stocks, which is the European VIX in order to fill that liquidity gap, right? So having identified that gap, we found a process to be able to fill that gap. And, uh, and so those are, you're at, in essence, getting three in one, you're getting your best beta, your best alpha and a tail protection overlay. That's what HRAA is as an all weather hundred year portfolio that also happens to fill a nice little gap for advisors as a sleeve on their traditional Very cool. portfolio. That's very cool. Wow. The, uh, I like the, uh, <laughs> you can see why we're excited about it. I like the, uh, the, the third, the third turn there with the, with the volatility overlay. That's, that's very interesting. Yeah. Uh, I mean, that well, makes it even more interesting. Yeah. Yeah. There's a bit of a story on that recently, whilst, uh, Russia was invading Ukraine initially, and there was a lot of talk of all kinds of very serious implications for geopolitical issues um you know the red if we if we think about that volatility um tail protection uh, strategy was flashing red and so we had pretty significant exposure to the opportunity for significant bad you know high risk outcomes where we had that hedge on now it abated nothing happened it didn't cost the portfolio too much uh, but it's certainly heartening when you get into those situations to see the portfolios responding and having protection um, 
from those types of extreme outcomes. Absolutely. And, and look, it added around last I saw 11 basis points to return for the year. So nothing yeah. much, but while it was on, it abated volatility. Yeah. yeah. Right. So it's okay. Maybe we don't make a return there, but it minimizes the risk if you're caught offside. So that, that's been kind of neat to watch. Yeah. I mean, you definitely sleep better at night. You touched on it already, but, but talk about how, uh, talk about how HRAA has no bias and, and because of that could be, uh, extremely painful to most investors to hold during a concentrated and prolonged bull market. I know, I know we touched on it, but, but, uh, I think what goes hand in hand in that, uh, with that is that HRAA is expected to outperform during inflation and bear markets and, but underperform during bull markets, right? It depends on the bull market. So recall, we've talked about the inflation and growth dynamics a lot today and that they create those four regimes. And if you think about that chart that, um, Rodrigo showed very early on, you could see when we're in a disinflationary growth period or even inflationary growth, you know, a lot of stock bond portfolios can perform quite well. Where we get into stagflation or disinflationary growth, uh, the 1929 period, 2008, and then stagflation would be the 70s. When you get into those periods, that traditional 60-40 portfolio does really poorly. And so now, remember we talked about it's a comparative. Right. So if the a particular zeitgeist of the moment for investors has a particular tracking error to it, whether that's NASDAQ or S and P or ARC, um, that, that is going to be an area where a well-diversified, properly balanced portfolio, even adding some alpha, it's going to underperform. You're just simply not going to compete with the best asset class. Now, most people aren't in the best asset class for the whole rut. They're in it at the end. Yeah. They're not in it at the start. So this is something where, and why we do so much education to keep them in these diversified portfolios when they're suffering this tracking error, this perceived underperformance. And then when we get an impulse like this and, oh, wow, look, crisis necessity change. Hey, hey, change. You know, you can think about changing some stuff that they'll be, um, comfortable enough and confident enough to actually make allocations and make changes to the portfolio. I think one thing that's, that's really difficult is when you get losses in a portfolio, people won't make the change because they, they just want to hold back yeah. on until they break even, <clears throat> right? That loss aversion, uh, behavioral bias. And so, you know, if you're there early and you're kind of always prepared, you don't have to think about that stuff. It's happening underneath the surface. Um, but if you're a little, you know, offside or tilted, you're now looking at your portfolio, maybe it's down 10, maybe it's down 20, you've got 90, 80, 90 cents in the dollar and you, and you're like, oh, it, maybe it's over. Maybe it's going to come back. Those commodities haven't done anything anyway. And so, you know, having some discipline, getting some education, you know, um, making sure you have, you know, the, the understanding of what's going on to traverse the journey, uh, are important. Yeah, Pierre, I don't want to tell you how much we're currently underperforming those that are obsessed with the natural <laughs> gas. <laughs> Poor yes, right? precisely. Like that, that is a bad, that is a bad look. Yeah. Right? The point is underperformance is relative to those people that really cared about NASDAQ, right? Or FANGs. Yeah. Or Tesla. Yeah. ARC, right? Like it's even advisors that have been thoughtful about diversifying within equities. The ones that, that prefer S and P 500 over fangs have felt the pain of underperformance relative to what people cared about. Right. So I think broadly speaking, we can say that because we are diversified and because most advisors are not, because you have the 60% in domestic equities, maybe a little bit of international, that when there is a very low inflation, uh, and, and, uh, and really transparent market where everything seems to be working fine when global communities are collaborating, where inventories are moving around freely, where there is no inflation, you're going to have a highly con concentrated set of equities that are going to benefit from that clarity and growth. Uh, we're going to underperform that because we will have some of that, but just, we just won't have a hundred percent of that. Now switch over to when they perform poorly, inflation rears its ugly head. 
growth stocks are a low duration asset. They require long time horizons, people that are willing to invest when inflation is low, they're willing to invest with a 30 year project that may or may not happen more than when inflation is high. And they're looking now at real tangible assets because they don't know what's going to happen with the gross assets. So all of a sudden you have these gross stocks go down. And so gross stocks are down aggressively. We look amazing compared to them. So we are likely to outperform in periods where that shift changes. And we're likely to perform really nicely because we have exposure to, to commodities and we, we have the ability to short bonds and so on, right? So in bear markets, we can short equities and we can go along the things that are working. Maybe at that point, it's treasuries that, are, that we're long, right? So, um, so yes, I think one can safely say versus a domestically based 60-40 portfolio, we're likely to underperform in a, in a traditional bear market and we're likely to outperform an inflation uh, periods and and uh, bear market. Period. Do you ever feel funny? Do you ever, so think, do you ever, I think do you ever feel funny that you? Uh, I mean, you've been doing this for for over a decade now. But do you ever feel funny that you have to constantly explain this? Does this feel like 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 it's a constant? I mean, honestly, <laughs> honestly, no, not at all, no. <laughs> I'd be mean, we're so we're, we're, I, to the, to the, I used to take to the same person. Oh. Yeah, Many yeah. times, we're yeah. so we're so fallible. Well, you have to remember, they, yeah. I, I they talk. They talk to. We talk yeah. about this as a, as, a, but they only talk to us once in a while, yeah. and they go back into the world and the real world, and they get hit by all this other stuff, and the, the you know the financial, um, the, you know sort of the more traditional financial pornography out there is kind of steering them to just stocks, just stocks, just stocks all the time, and I think you know adding to you know, a point on what Rodrigo was saying, what he's really talking about is dispersion, yeah. right? If there's only one market or we have 10 markets to choose from, but they're all doing exactly the same thing, there's no opportunity to outperform. Yeah. When 10 markets are fanning out and you have dispersion amongst your return vectors or your areas of return or your return rates of return, this gives the active managers the opportunity to provide differentiated performance that's on stock indices as well as multi-asset it expands in the multi-asset space because you have so many more unique bets yeah as rodrigo said apple and microsoft you know google these things are somewhat correlated <laughs> you know right? i I, uh, I remember cibc royal bank bemo they're somewhat correlated oh come on um so I I, re I remember, I remember, uh, you know, I remember the presentation that, that we did with Craig Lazara from, uh, S and P right. and, and, you know, the, the, the one point that I remember to this day was his, his, uh, you know, point that dispersion was at a historical low and that, I mean, that was, that was, that's right. He did do that. Presentation. I got to pull that. that was, what was that? That was four years ago. Right. Three, three years ago or four years yeah. ago. And it, and it continued until, until last year, six yeah. months ago. <laughs> and, yeah. So I, you know, I, yeah. Yeah. That's a, that's a point I'm trying to make. So I did my own dispersion analysis and saw that in the two thousands, when we saw two bear markets and inflation go high, like a, you, you saw the commodity super cycle start in 99 and in February, 2011, you were looking at you know, peak dispersion as, and we measure it by bets, by just looking at forgetting about the line items, just you can do a max diversification algorithm to identify how many unique yeah. things are pulling in different directions. And you would see peaks of like 25 unique bets. Fast forward to the last decade, we're looking at peaks of five, right? So very different, um, very different secular, uh, environments and, and this Kumbaya peace and love, you know, multinational, uh, globalized, globalized economy has started to fall apart and it's a lot harder to build something. It's a lot easier to break it. And so we've broken the system in many respects with the wars that we're seeing, with inflation that we're seeing, you know, all it's no longer U S right. dollar against everything. It's cross, uh, currencies acting very differently, emerging markets that can do really well in, in the commodity bull market, like Peru, South Africa, um, Argentina, which are exporters of grains and gold and silver and zinc. They're doing really well. And the emerging markets that import all of that are doing really poorly. So that's a type of dispersion that you can intuitively understand is happening and not likely to go away for a while. The same thing with sovereign bonds in different company countries, same thing with equity markets, right? All of a sudden you go from fangs being the winner and hence the U S being the only asset class that made any real money in the last decade to 
opportunities absolutely everywhere. And the idea that this is going to end tomorrow seems to me outrageous. <laughs> and so I think not just us, not in the multi-asset space, but I think we're going to go back to a point where Vanguard is like the, 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 the wrong thing to do. This idea of passive equity investing yeah. at five basis points. We're going to go back to a time in the 2000s. If you recall, the best performing fund in the 2000s was Sprott Equity Fund that made positive returns in 2000, 2001, 2002 yeah. by being long only. Why? Because they went into the commodity space. Berkshire Hathaway made money by being a value manager, positive returns during those three years. So all of a sudden, we're going to go from the S&P market cap weighted index being the be all and end all at the lowest cost to advisors wanting to buy the best equity managers, buy the best active bond managers, buy the best multi-asset managers. And that's going to be a transition, but you're better for it, I think, given what we see in the It's economy. just, you know, I just <laughs> to go back to you know, Craig Lazara's point, which was, I, I felt like the underlying, the underlying message there was just give in, give in <laughs> to passive. Right. And I almost, I almost hated it. Well, S and P launched the risk parity index <laughs> yeah. shortly thereafter. Right. Like the problem now is that I've always had this, like, well, now Vanguard's going to suffer. Well, Vanguard just launched a bunch of active ETS. Yeah. Right, they're too smart. They're too smart for us. They're one step ahead. Everybody's just going to go from Vanguard passive to Vanguard active. <laughs> well, there's there's also the issue. Yeah, uh, active has um, you know constraints. You know, the, there are constraints of capacity and things like that that have to be contemplated. So, yeah, it's not quite that yeah. easy. And there's lots of hurting and probably lots of behavioral alpha to be uh, garnered as we go from from here to there. And uh, yeah bit of fun along the way, hopefully. So now it, it seems like a little bit of what you're doing is, uh, like a, is a bit of a black box approach. So imagine you have to do, we think of it as a clear box, <laughs> a glass yeah. box, but you have to do a lot of work, obviously, right? You have to, you have sure. to bridge that, that gap between, between, uh, you know, the traditional, like if we've had 40 years of 60, 40. And, and, hmm. you know, we're, we're, we've got like, so we've got 40 years of, you know, we need, we, we need so much confirmation bias, right. When we're making these decisions, like on, I mean, I don't mean, sure. you know, specifically us, but I, I, I just mean in general, investors require so much confirmation bias and, you know, we've had 40 years of, of confirmation bias of, of how, you know, to do a portfolio, how to, how to, you know, have the, uh, the stock bond mix. What would you say just in order to help make that leap from, from, you know, the 60, 40 of the last 40 years, you know, bias to abandoning some of the elements of that in favor of what you're doing? Well, I think the, the one thing is I, I'm not sure that anyone should abandon yeah. anything. One should, each individual investor needs to think about what their tracking error is, how they want to think about the comfort and discomfort that they're going to feel on the journey, both in tracking her to their friends and drawdowns, because these things will end the, uh, journey. And they always end the journey when someone has experienced maximum risk. And then what will happen inevitably is return will come, but you've crystallized your risk and you don't get the subsequent return. So you really have to be honest with yourself as the individual investor, looking at your circumstances, looking at your behavioral proclivities and figure out what's real and true for you. Yeah. So once we get that out of the way, you know, then you have to start thinking about how might I add these different types of strategies. And so we do get, you know, sometimes, Hey, there's a lot of math. You're, you know, you're doing a lot of calculus and whatnot, but the, there are humans there with significant amounts of, of, um, experience and oversight that are constantly, you know, watching the models, the portfolios that are coming out of the models. And there are things that you're your models don't know that you do know. And so there is practitioners. So we've been in this business. We have our traders been trading for 15 years, our, uh, you know, he head of, uh, resolve asset management Inc. Inc. Jason Russell has had 20 years of experience right. in the futures. Uh, so the team is pretty steeped in experience in this marketplace. The rules or the, the systematic nature in which we, we build positions is simply because 
the dimensionality and the complexity of that space is not approachable by the human mind. Yeah. yeah. We have to take some, we have to do some calculus. We have to think about these things and then we have to review that output and say, okay, where are the blind spots here and how might we manage those blind spots? Those, those blind spots are often fairly rare and they beget the question, why is this a blind spot and why isn't that decision-making systematic? Uh, but so, so, so it's not it's actually, it's not actually a black box. I mean, I know, no, I know, I know, I know box. you weren't kidding no. <laughs> when you said it's, it's, a, yeah, it's, it's a, a clear a, box. It's a, it's, it's a clear box. Uh, See, I think, I think even if you just like, like if you just, if you broke out your portfolio to everybody at any given moment on any given day, you know, they wouldn't know what to make of it. Right. Because there's so much, there's so many components. They, well, they, this they, is, this is where they, I think they, it's an get important, a general idea. I mean, they but, could, because we have done yeah. a, a strong effort. They've, we've done a strong effort to be able to translate those many line items into something. That makes it's sense, clear to right? you. So, uh, right. the, the yeah. efforts here requires education. Yeah. Requires education it, and it requires access, right? So we, with Horizons have teamed up to put together a report at the end of each year, the attribution report that shows, you know, top five long positions, top five short positions, top gainers, uh, bottom gainers, and also the risk exposures, both long and short. So that people go right now, they'll see that last month we were net short bonds. We were, you know, net short, um, or net long the U S dollar and so on and so forth. And they can get an idea of what's happening. We're also working on putting together a, a dashboard that provides live access to what's happening in the bond complex for the fund, right. what's happening in energy. So because it's different, there might be a day where we're down two and equity markets are up one. They'll, they'll have questions. Clients will have questions by being able to, to log in and check out what's going on underneath the hood. They ha they are empowered to say, oh, I see that resolve is sh long energies in a big way. And today the markets lost 5%, those en energy markets lost 5%. That's why we pay them. This is exactly as expected, right? So this is again, trying to go from very, what may seem like, I don't understand what's going on to providing access and education through these means and, and our, your yeah. podcast and our personal podcast and, and the research report that we do. And once you do that a, a few times, you realize, oh, this is no different than anything else. I actually don't need to ask Coca-Cola, <laughs> you know, how they yeah. make Coca-Cola and understanding that Coca-Cola isn't just that one beverage. It's a wide variety of distribution and, and different countries providing multiple products. And you want to go down that rabbit hole or do you just want to kind of get an idea of what Coca-Cola is? Well, like, like a, like a right? bottle, like a, like a bottle of inflation. Coke, so on, you know, you can see what's in the bottle. <clears throat> so you guys are actually, I think what I want to clarify is just, is, is, is that, yeah. you know, you guys are doing what you're doing. You're doing it in a fishbowl. Everybody can see what you're doing. If you want them, you know, if, if they, if they want to look at it, mm -hmm. they can see it. Right. So, so, if they want to look at so, it. yeah. And they'll understand it. Yeah. And but the illusion understand. that there's some kind of a black box strategy happening there is just because of the knowledge gap. It's, it's much not more. A, it's not a, it's yeah. Yeah. It's much more right. intuitive than people think. It's, it's sort of like, you know, there are different types of people and, um, there are different types of wristwatches and people would like to know the time. <laughs> and some people just want a watch that says what time yeah. it is. Some people want a really fancy watch where you can see inside and you can see all the gears working. And you know, those people not only want to know what time it is, but they want to know how the time was calculated. Yeah. And then there's other people who just ask a friend what time it is and don't wear a watch. <laughs> so there's, there's a lot of personalities out there about how you might want to tell yeah. the time. And yeah, at the end of the day, if you're looking for non-correlated, <laughs> I'm assuming you have one of these and you yeah, just exactly. look at the time there. But, <laughs> so, so you know, um, I think it's just a function of what are you looking for? Well, if you're looking for a non-correlated differentiated product that will provide returns when things might be uh, shitty in the rest of your portfolio, i.e. long correlated and it's risk managed and has some of the features we've talked about today, well, then this watch is for you. And if you'd like to look at the inside of the watch, we will oblige yeah. you to look around the inside of the watch. It's fine. It's a clear box. We don't, we don't have a problem. There's, there are some things that are proprietary, you know, no question about that. There, there, we have to protect yeah, absolutely. the internal knowledge and proprietary knowledge we have. We have to preserve that edge for the clients we have today. We can't give it all away for free. But we want to make sure you have a good understanding of how the watch works. Now, 
The next question is, are you the guy who's just going to ask your friend what, what time it is? Do you, you know, you want the clear watch? You just want the watch. You're going to do it on your phone. We're, we're happy to. Yeah, I just don't like the way it gets trapped under my shirt cuff. I yeah. hate that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. That's good. <laughs> so w what type of ongoing risk can people expect from HRAA? Well, this is the great thing about having thought about this for as long as we have, right? Uh, you got to rem remember this is, this was not built in order to create something that looks really good for marketing purposes. This was built because we wanted to put our own money and wealth in something that is as robust as it possibly can be, right? So what ongoing risks? Well, we target a level of volatility to make sure that we don't see any real outsized risks. The diversification from an intuitive perspective means that that idea of the left fat tail in a distribution, you know, that Nassim yeah. Taleb black swan event, are the, the, once you diversify and any advisor can do this by adding some gold, some commodities, some equities, some bond to the right allocations, you'll see that the fat tails become really thin. So you're already managing that, that, that black swan risk. You stat on top of that, you, you tack on the ability to go short and, and do it systematically. You start narrowing that distribution even further. So just broadly speaking, this has been designed for my employees, my families, my partners, wealth, and, and what I consider to be my extended partners, which are the advisors in the U S Canada and globally that invest in our product. Now this, all of everything that I just discussed is risk that we have diversified away and that we understand and can see inflation, growth, liquidity. What is the non-diversifiable risk? that from an academic perspective means we should expect an, a positive re return above cash. Well, the non-diversifiable risk, the largely due to the black box inside politicians and fed governor's heads. And this is not a unique risk to us and HRAA. It's a unique risk as we know to every investor, whether you're an equity investor or bond investor or otherwise, when Bernanke came out and started raising rates uh, unexpectedly in 2006 or, or even in 08, right? When they thought inflation was out of control. That, that's, that's a hit that wasn't expected. When Powell comes out and says, we are nowhere near neutral in terms of where rates should be, the market didn't expect that. That came overnight. Once the market realizes that their, the price of cash is here and yeah. overnight it's over here, the present value discounted mechanism means that everything goes down at the same time together, bonds, equities, commodities, the whole thing just boom, just takes a step down. And that is the risk that is non-diversifiable because it is very human and very immediate. Um, so it's not, it's, it just doesn't solve anything. Volatility will exist in a product, a very diversified product like this. And that's the volatility that you, uh, that pays for that excess return above cash. It does. Does that make sense? It does. But that. <clears throat> that's largely, that's why you have the volatility overlay as well, right? Yeah. Yeah. But even then that, that volatility overlay is more of a liquidity shock that happens right. over days within a drawdown. What I'm talking about is on a Sunday, the fed governor thinks to do something yeah. and announces it on a Monday. And there is an immediate repricing of, of assets. That's that one. You can't just diversify away from like, you can't go long volatility fast <laughs> enough. Well, that's good. That, that clarifies, that clarifies things. So, um, access is clearly important to most investors and it seems like the ETF is ideal for most investors, but you guys also, you have offering memorandum based hedge funds for accredited investors in Canada, the evolution fund and the Osprey fund for those accredited investors listening to this. Can you tell us what you're trying to do with the hedge funds in contrast to HRAA? Yeah. So uh, the hedge funds, as I described what HRAA is, right? This is trying to democratize institutional quality, best equity, best long only portfolio, the all weather risk parity strategy alongside a unique pure alpha strategy that has equal chance of going long and short with that tail protection, right? The, the reason that this works well in retail is number one, at 8% volatility, most people will be able to stick to it long-term as a line item in the portfolios. And number two, it participates in global growth. It, it 50% of the exposure is at all weather and yet a portfolio that will benefit from positive liquidity environments 
and will participate in that equity growth and that bond growth when it's appropriate. So we do provide a little bit of that traditional exposure while it being more balanced than a 60-40 portfolio. So th this has been tried and tested in the United States. There's been plenty of products that have married good beta with good alpha over years. And it is it has, like Mike alluded to, uh, stick to itness, right? Investors require don't just require the pure mathematical best model. They require the a combination or, or a proportion of the pure mathematical best model and their behavioral best model. And I think the the best beta plus best beta alpha approach at a level of risk that people can take was ideal for uh, the public product HRAA. There's also uh, constraints that exist within a uh, even a liquid right. alt uh, alternative that don't exist in the hedge fund space. So there's a lot of money we're leaving on the table by just only offering a pro public product. So the offering memorandum fund uh, allows us to target higher levels of risk. Right? So for the evolution fund targets of volatility similar to that of uh, the S&P 500 at 15% okay. volatility. So for those accredited investors and, and advisors that really do use that, that see it, are okay with having something that's very different because the hedge fund excludes the beta part, excludes that risk parity. It's just offering the pure unadulterated alpha at a level of risk that matches that of equities. It means that if you can, if, if you're inclined to allocate to private product, uh, the offering memorandum funds, you can now allocate less to a product like okay. uh, Evolution and get more bang for your buck, more diversification benefits. And because it has a zero correlation long-term to equities and a zero correlation long-term to, to bonds, it means that you can be, you can use it as a, a pick and shovel type of line item for your client's portfolios, right? So that fund in contrast to Horizons is up around 33% year to date, right? So that's three times the, the exposure. Wow. So this is, this is what, um, what the differentiation is. It allows being able to have no restrictions in, uh, in terms of, um, what the regulators have on public product actually creates opportunity, um, and, uh, and, and, you know, requires a bit of education mm -hmm. and so on, but it is available in most platforms. Um, it is in FundServe as well. Excellent. So retail advisors yeah. can take advantage of this, uh, if they're inclined to do private OM product. Amazing. Uh, that that's actually pretty you anything, Mike? that you offer the, the different tiers of participation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's great. We just need to uh, off OM seems to be because of this massive growth in private in, in um, passive investing, it's become people are, are willing to jump that hurdle less, but we're starting yeah. to see that change yeah. at, I bet these days. Yeah. It, it's, it's for, you know, again, a sophisticated accredited investors and there's requirements around that for those who can participate. And that's, that's the regulatory regime we live in. And so those who are interested, certainly reach out and we can see if that that's appropriate um, for you or reach out to your advisor and ask them if it's appropriate. I think the, the one thing I would emphasize is, is just to put it out there, capital efficiency, just right. that wording is what Rodrigo was talking about in that, in that real estate in a portfolio. So, you know, if you were having a 15% allocation to HRAA, you could probably get away with a 5% allocation to the evolution product and have the same impact to your portfolio. That means of course you have an extra 10% of your portfolio that you could be invested in other beta assets. And so, um, you'll have something meaningful in your portfolio that can really change the feel of a bear market from the portfolio or change the feel of a inflationary impulse, et cetera. And, uh, and we've, we've written on that too. So if you want to learn about capital efficiency, it's, you know, investresold.com yeah. and can, you can find it there. Just use that, uh, Google. Google Plex. Yeah, but we're okay. I mean, talk about where investors can find you, where advisors can find you. Yeah. I think if, if you were to Google either my name, Mike Philbrick or Rodrigo Cortez's yeah. name, there's <laughs> going to be an absolute treasure trove of, of things, but certainly investresolve.com is the, uh, the website, um, for, uh, social media. I'm on LinkedIn under my name and then uh, for Twitter, it's Mike Philbrick 99. Um, and you've got Gestalt U is our, uh, partner and our CIO, Adam Butler and, um, and Rod, I'll let you rhyme off your Rod. Yeah. Rod Gordillo P. There was another Rod Gordillo without the P. So make sure you get that yep. P in there for Twitter. And, uh, yeah, honestly for the ETF, it's go to horizons and, uh, look for H R A A. Yep. Look at under the corporate class and you'll be able to see 
what all weather equity lines look like. Um, and then for the evolution fund, you can go to investresolve.com and go under strategies and then, um, alternative funds and then evolution Canada, because we offer these in different jurisdictions. So you'll be able to get in there and get all the information, uh, for that, uh, for that fund. So yeah, there's plenty of places to choose. Uh, we've written over 300 articles. We pub, we were over 120 <laughs> podcasts, uh, yep. on the resolve riffs and, um, and we wrote a book called, uh, adaptive asset allocation, dynamic portfolios designed to thrive in changing environments. So, um, plenty of places to, to look at. I think one of the ones that I want to emphasize is the masterclass podcast series. Uh, you can just go to Spotify, look up resolves masterclass and you, yeah and you can episodes, get uh, uh 15 to 20 two and minutes and a half CE credits on advisor analysts that's too right. that's yep. right you go to our ce page that's yeah. right so you can go to um yeah. on the yeah you can go to the ce page and advisor analyst and get that ce credit if you're an advisor that that needs them and um and i think that's a that's a great place to continue this journey if you if you uh stayed with us this far you want to get, you want to reiterate and, and kind of, uh, solidify your understanding of what we talked about that. Yeah. Would be and it's all there. It's all, I mean, <clears throat> it's all at invest resolve. It's all, it's all in your blogs. I mean, you know, anybody who actually wants to learn, uh, 300 articles, uh, it's, it's a pretty, uh, profound well of knowledge that you'll find there. Um, guys, we love you. We love what you do. Um, wow. Every success guys, it's, it's just, uh, it's such an exciting time for you and, and it's an exciting time for, uh, HRAA. Uh, thank you so much for, thank yeah. you so much for this incredible 90 minutes. Um, thanks for having us and well, thank and you. We'll, uh, we'll see you on Monday yeah. too. And, and, uh, yeah, the other thing is we raise your average. We're here hosting a myriad of other advisors and portfolio managers and just talking, uh, talk and shop generally. Thank you, Pierre. Really appreciate all your efforts and, um, and hope to continue to contribute uh, as, as anybody who hasn't been listening to the podcast, uh, we like to poke holes in other people's uh, <laughs> thought process. So it, it's a, it's a fun thing if you have. Absolutely. I, I, you know, my, uh, my average has been raised just by doing it. So <laughs> thanks guys. Thanks, Pierre.